Good morning, Covina United Methodist Church people. Good morning. Did I wake you up? <laughs> well, well, it's good to see you. I know summer is drawing to a close, right? Right. For those of you, for, for hopefully, yeah. For those of you who have been traveling, are are beginning to come back or getting ready to come back in the next week or two, I think those that, are, those that we have missed fall summer will be back. So I'm kind of excited. Fall season, you know, when the choir is back, when, when the school gets started, you know, I think the school, schools are starting in the next couple days uh, and everything will be kicked in and we will plunge into it and, uh, and then see this year end in high note. Is that good enough? But it is certainly beautiful to see all of you, and I hope our time together will be a blessing, a time worth, um, time well spent. Amen? We have a great liturgy this morning. Tracy will lead us. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship in your bulletin. Will you please stand if you're able? <laughs> Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that we might serve you with your reverence. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits. And in God's word, I put my hope. Israel, put your hope in the Lord and in God's unfailing love. Out of the depths, I cry to you. Lord, hear my voice. Please remain standing and join us for hymn number 469, Jesus is all the world to me. Seated. 
and let us pray. O bread of heaven, come down. Come down and fill us with your spirit, for your spirit satisfies like no other. We hunger and thirst for you this morning and long to be nurtured in your love and forgiveness. So we come to this sacred time and place where our hungers are finally and fully satisfied as only your bread can do. We will wait and listen for your leading in this hour. Amen. For our time of joints and concerns, um, we all have witnessed or witnessing the ongoing fire, not just in California, but in many parts of our country. Um, a couple of days ago, Helena and I drove to Temecula. On the way to Temecula, we, of course, drove through um, Lake Elsinore and Marietta, and that whole area was just so dark. And even during the midday, you can just see those flames, not just in one area, but in several areas. Um, and so all of those things take tolls on people, especially uh, firefighters, um, those pilots who bring water and drop water on those fires. Uh, uh, we need to keep, uh, keep all of those folks uh, in our prayers. You know, we watch them helplessly, uh, but the um, other thing that we can do is prayer. The other thing is um, uh, California Pacific Annual Conference uh, uh, have a disaster response team. And I think people in this conference are beginning to uh, recruit people. Uh, I think uh, there were some who responded to San Diego area. I'm in their mailing list. I went to their one training, so I am not really qualified to be out there. Uh, but because I went to one training, my name is on the list and I get everything what's going on. So we need to also keep our own churches, people who are trained and are our first, first responder or, um, you know, United Methodist Committee on Relief, uh, uh, they, ha they have ways of responding. And so let's keep all of those people in our prayer this morning. Uh, Robert uh, told me that um, he had a, he visited Brian, uh, uh, after his massive surgery, uh, he is slowly getting his way around at the house, uh, but um, uh, still a lot in, in, in a lot of pain, and he, and he will be in, in pain for, for a while. So let's keep Brian in our prayer, and his mother a blessing, um, because she's juggling, you know, her work, as well as taking care of this uh, very, what should I say, active uh, son, uh, Brian. Any other concerns that you might have this morning that, that we should come around with you and pray? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, if you didn't hear, uh, Margaret, who is who is struggling with Alzheimer's, uh, she will go through a surgery on Wednesday, and so to keep her in our prayer. Um, 
So, this is what I like to do. If some of you nearby her or anybody want to come around, come around and just put your hands on, on Margaret, please. You know, because that's what, that's what scripture talks about. That's what scripture talks about. Okay? That's what James chapter 5 talks about. If anyone need prayer, lay your hands on them and pray. Okay? And if you can't, put your hands out. Okay? Let's pray. Oh, gracious God. Even before we open our mouth, you know the groanings of our hearts. Even our own maybe frustrations with our health issues, this unrelenting fire that is consuming acres and acres every single day, moving people out of their homes, thousands of firefighters fighting these raging fires. Lord, you know the needs of our hearts. We come to you, Lord, for help. We come for a healing for Margaret. Doctors who will be working on her are your people. They do what, what they do because of the wisdom, intellectual knowledge that you have given them. May the doctors who will be working on her be guided by your wisdom. May their minds and the precision hands be used by you. Lord, may your comforting grace keep her calm in your care and her caring husband and the rest of the family. Lord, we also offer our prayer for Brian that every single day that he will experience some healing coming to his leg and the bones are coming together strength is flowing in them so that Lord six weeks, eight weeks from now He'll be a stronger young man. Be with his mother and the rest of the family. Lord, we give you thanks for our church. For the love and the care that is here. And the willingness to do what we can. To serve you in the best way we know how. Keep us humble to serve you even better today. Could you join me in the Lord's Prayer, please? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, people, for coming around, Margaret. Well, I think children are already back in Sunday school. So we have a hymn, 399. Take my life and let it be. The scripture reading is from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 through chapter 5, verse 2. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit, with which you are marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God and Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us, and give, gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Be seated.
Indeed, he lives within our heart. A beautiful old hymn. Pray with me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our strength and our redeemer, Christ our Lord. Amen. So there is a picture up there. Do you, do you have one of those at home? Yeah? Some of you probably have more than one, right? Especially if you, if you bake on a regular basis, um, you probably have even, even better than that one, right? Um, so, you know, my wife don't bake. So we don't have anything, a unique appliance like that one in our kitchen. But I know some of you have all kinds, and I brought what, what we have in my house, in my kitchen. This is really not exactly as that one, but in case someday I fried something. <laughs> so in a future tense, so I uh, saw this in the market one day, and I just bought it. I haven't used it yet, so it's been a couple of weeks now. But I do have this thing. I think we have about three or four of these in our kitchen. And uh, this is, of course, not for baking purposes, but to wash some vegetables in the kitchen before I cook them. And then I have this very unique, this is, uh, this one I use every morning to make spicy Indian chai. Mm -hmm. So this is a special uh, gadget, appliance, tiny but does some masterful chai. And then, of course, um, um, in some construction area, some people use some big stuff like that. Um, and archaeologists uh, use them as well. So, Sif. Sif, right? Sif. Sif? So, I'm, I'm pronouncing right, right? No. Okay, Sif. So, uh, um, so uh, these are uh, very important uh, tools so that, so that, um, so that uh, we can, we can uh, somehow uh, filter the chaffs or the rough textures or coarse textures uh, from baking or from, from constructions or to find what you're looking uh, at, the, at an archaeological uh, uh, digging. Um, especially for if you are cooking a, baking a special birthday cake for somebody very special, you don't want some lumpy flour in the middle of the cake. So, so shift are, 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 are very, very important. Uh, uh, in, in the kitchen. Um, so, so here's my question, though. What kind of, what kind of shift do you have in your own personal life? Does it make sense? Is there something that you use to even filter some of the things that you hear every day. The onslaught of information that bombards us on a daily basis. 
Some of them are just propagandas, right? Which is plenty out there. And there are some conspiracy stuff that is out there. And there are some provocateurs on the right and even in the left. They're swindling facts and fictions, you know. And what we consume daily will reorient how we function daily. And therefore, the question is, you know, what kind of shit, you know, do we use? Do you have a tiny one? Or do you have a, a medium one? Or do you have something big so that so that we are careful at what we consume. Bishop Willeman, professor at Duke, wrote these words. Just as soon as Oxford Dictionary, named 2016, the year of post-truth, 2017 blew right past that moniker. No sooner had the new year started than we were questioning the validity of photos to tell a truthful story, the terms like alternative facts had, some normal, uh, had become normal to hear in, 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 in the public, no longer certain where to turn. We increasingly curate our lives and our exposure to reality. Study after study shows that we are increasingly segmented and polarized, listening to sources for news and information that sustain our already formed vision of what is true and what is not. At first, we might have laughed, but now the sustained attacks on what is true, what is not true, and even when we can, we, we call something a lie is wearing us down, end of quote. So this article is basically describing our country, our society. Mm. Even among good friends, relationships are a little not very intimate. They're paralyzed. People are afraid to express their opinions on any matter because you feel you feel they might attack you or dislike you or distant from you. Hmm. Single source of information, single interpretation is creating vacuum in human relationships. I don't think any one of us like it. There's a scripture in Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 23, and it says, guard your heart, your mind above all else, for it determines the course of your life. That, that makes sense. What goes in will come out unless you delete them. Right? Delete is a good button on your computer keyboard. If you don't like something, just delete them. So, how are we as followers of Jesus Christ live truthfully? How do we behave in this polarized culture where truth-telling has become even harder? Does it make sense? 
Look at our bulletin cover, for example. I know it's a very exaggerated, but the message is very true. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, right? Yeah, it's very true. The message is true. How do we use our tongue? If you don't have one of these sifting what you are saying, if you are not filtering what you are thinking and what you are saying, your words are going to fly like bullets. And it's going to hit somebody. And it's going to hurt somebody. Does that make sense? Yeah, that is, that is something that we all need to be aware of. One of the best known 18th century poet in England was Dr. Samuel Johnson. He was a very devout Christian. On one occasion, Boswell, his good friend, asked him, what's the point of sharing meal, you know, with these people? You know, they're, good. they're no good people. What's the point? I like his answer. He says, to eat and drink together and to promote kindness. I like that. Yeah, I think we as Christians, we need to find every way possible to, to uh, practice kindness. So, kindness, Anglican scholar, N.T. Wright, I write, I, not I write, I read his materials on a very regular basis, and this is what he says. Kindness is a virtue not often considered but it remains central to Christianity. Central to what is Christianity? Kindness is one of the purest forms of the imitation of God. Unfortunately, there are too many Christians and sometimes churches have allowed themselves to forget that kindness and mutual forgiveness as the very essence of Christian community. End of quote. I like that. You know, it's, we, we sometimes operate as if kindness is, is like a multiple choice question. You know, it's, it's, it's optional. You know, no. Kindness is essence of who we are as people of faith. So, so there is something going on in this church in Ephesus that, that is not really pleasing Apostle Paul. He already knew, if you read chapter 1, <coughs> he knew already how good this church was. <coughs> He commented, complimented about the genuineness of their faith. But obviously, something did horribly maybe wrong in this church. Hence, the letter he wrote. Hence, the chapter we read this morning. But I wanted, to, I wanted to take you to verse 18, I mean 17 first, before I go to the text that Tracy read for us. In chapter 4, verse 17, he is saying, I am telling you this. 
Don't live like unbelievers. They are disconnected from God. He, in fact, uses the word Gentile. That means ungenerated, not reformed. Once you were this kind of people who did things in the darkness. But now you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. You have given your life to Jesus. And therefore, don't live this way, but live it this way. Does it make sense? He is trying to help them see that, that who we are now as followers of Christ is different than yesterday. Change, he says. Change your former way of life. Once you were corrupted by deceitful desires. Mm -hmm. And then he comes to the text that Tracy read for us. And it starts with the word, therefore. Now, we all know when somebody says, therefore, they are trying to remind you to understand what the teacher had said. Now, therefore, recapping, this is what I, this is what I told you, and, and this is what needs to be done, right? So, he used the word, therefore, to say that all things need to be stripped away. I think some translations said, get rid of it. The word get rid of it in Greek is Strip away. If I told the 830 people that I used to have an old leather jacket, it was worn out. Externally, it looked nice, but internally, Everything is falling apart. I could put nothing in the pockets because it disappears. Just, just like some mouse had gone through it. Apostle Paul is saying, get rid of those old garments. Don't give it to rummet sale. Throw it away. Pull it out from your body. And get rid of it. Strip away. Strip away, he says. Another way of describing strip away is, you know, snakes, they shed, right? Snakes, sometime, either you go to the zoo or when I was growing up in the jungle, you roam around and suddenly you see this, you know, something that snake had left behind. Caught between two branches or, you know, a rough two stones and snake slithers away between those two and leave behind the old skin and it goes out with the new skin. So Apostle Paul is saying, we, Christians, followers of Christ, need to, need to strip away lying, anger, 
stealing, dirty talks, hard feelings, even bitterness. These are things that are fracturing the church in Ephesus. These are things that still fractures church today, right? Yeah, even today. Mm -hmm. Let us not be blind. Yes, we are human, and, and we do have some shortcomings. I think Apostle Paul understands that. But he is trying to tell the congregation, if some of these things becomes your operational theology in the church that will control your mind, stifle your spirituality, and you will lose the meaning and purpose of being a church. Yeah. He is really attacking what's happening in the church to, to really remove it. I think uh, Apostle, Paul, Apostle Paul probably is is uh, reminding them what he had spoken to Christians at Corinth in chapter 2, verse 17. You know, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Yes, see, everything has become new. I think that is what he is trying to emphasize to Christians at Ephesus. The word disciple comes out from the word discipline, right? Yeah. And so we need, we need some Christian discipline so that we can be his disciple. See? We cannot let our old ways, old ways of doing things to, to determine what we do here today as a church. That is what Apostle Paul is trying to say. In other words, Apostle Paul is focusing in this text to build stronger relationships. Now, relationship, it's not a Christian word. It is not qualified. For church alone. Even in the larger community, wherever there is good relationship in the neighborhood, they thrive, they do well. Wherever in the community there is no good relationships, they're falling apart. See? And so Apostle Paul is saying, we need to focus on building relationship in church. However, Paul is not missing when he says relationship, he is trying to hook in people to understand it's because of Jesus, right? last Sunday sermon, because we have one Lord, one Christ, one baptism, you know, because of all these things, we need to be one. And today, he's escalating even that by saying, you know, we need to get rid of some of these old ways of doing things so that we can grow together. And two Sundays ago, Apostle Paul says, said, be rooted and grounded in the word. If we are not rooted and grounded in the word, then everything what I'm saying is not going to make any sense. Yeah. 
not going to make sense. And therefore, because of Jesus, because of Jesus, we are who we are today, and therefore, we need to get rid of the old way. Relationships are broken fast, whether they are in church or outside. When you don't have, when you do not have filters to consume the news, information, your understanding about relationships about others are blurry. When it is blurry, then what you say, how you say, will be different. It's almost like groping in the dark. I told a story at 8.30 class this morning that when I was growing up, in Nagaland, there was no street lights. Absolutely no street lights. But I walked to church three miles. So most youth meetings were at night. And I would be coming home at 10, 11 o'clock. And in the pitch dark where, where you cannot even see your hand in front of you, I'm trying to find my way home, three miles. I know my mother very kindly reminded us, son, take flashlight with you. And for, the, for those of us who, who grew up in the British colonial power, we call them torchlight, right? We used to call torchlight. Take the torchlight with you. And you know, when you're young, you're stupid. You know, you don't want to carry another thing in your hand and go to the meeting. And so we just go to the meeting without the flashlight, the torchlight, and the meeting is over, and now you're trying to come home. You know, you know that there is the wall here, and there is a cliff over here, and therefore you're trying to walk as close, you know, feeling your way, and then a rat's move, some mice moves around, some creatures, and then you go, oh, what's up, you know. And then you still gently try to find your way home. Friends, I'm telling you that story to say it is not fun living in the dark. It is not fun to find your way home in the dark. And therefore, Apostle Paul is saying, whatever is hampering, hampering your way forward as followers of Jesus Christ, those things need to go. Those things cannot determine how you live your Christian life. That's what it is. I don't want Covina United Methodist Church to be a place of gossip. Right? You don't want that. I think I have a little, little, um, uh, see? Yeah. Who want to come to a church where there is gossip? I don't want you guys to talk to me about me. If you want to know something, talk to me. Don't ask 10 different people about me. I would rather see you at a Starbucks or somewhere else, wherever you're comfortable. Let's sit, let's talk. Clarify, I'll clarify. Don't do the same thing for Debbie either. Don't ask 10 different people. What do you think about Debbie? No. Go straight to her and ask. Sorry for picking you. <laughs> but you know, 
A church needs to be a, a, a safe zone for prayer and building relationship. If that becomes the centrality of our spiritual formation, people will be curious what's going on at Covina United Methodist Church. They are just so nice. Oh, don't you want to hear that? They are so nice. I like going there because people are so friendly. Oh, man. So, you know, we have some goals to set. Let, let us make this place a place of prayer where we pray for people, where we are willing to raise our hand and touch a sister or brother who is in need of our prayer rather than gossiping for the person, against the person. Does it make sense? So, Ephesians is a great book. I think I have two more sermons to preach on this Ephesians. I hope you come. I'm not attacking personally anybody because the text is right in front of you. So, if you uh, have time, uh, read some of the things that Apostle Paul is talking about and then come prepare to wrestle with it or come to 830 to the Bible study because we do more things in 830 service. Okay? God bless. Thank you. Uh-huh. So here it is. Freely we have received, thus we freely give. Grace upon grace, let us express our love and appreciation to God by extending the grace and mercy of God to a hungry world. Let us give to the Lord.
O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We bow before you and thank you for the privilege to participate in the acts of kindness and love here on earth. May these gifts truly become instruments of your purposes here in our church, our community, and around the world. Amen. Please be seated. I think our children are ready to come. So good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, this morning we talked about bread, where we are learning that Jesus said he's the bread of life story. Is Jesus literally bread? No. No, okay, everybody's got that covered, all right. And we looked at different kinds of bread, and after this we're gonna go back and have our bread snacks. We've got a lot of bread to choose from. But what does bread do for us? We talked about this. What does bread do for us that Jesus also does for us in life? Does, does bread provide nourishment? We talked about that. We learned a new word. Do you remember what nutrients are? You forgot what they are, but you know the word, right? Some types are really good at birthday parties, especially um, Hawaiian bread. It's really, really, I suggest it. Yeah, so we learned there's all kinds of different breads. Cake is a bread, donuts bread, banana bread, we, we baguettes, bolillos, tortillas, cinnamon twist bread, all kinds of great breads. But they nourish life, and Jesus nourishes our life. And so... What we're wearing on us is the ways that we nourish each other's lives, the way that Jesus shows us our lives can be nourished by Jesus, but then we're also supposed to nourish each other's lives. And I don't know if you, you noticed this, but you all are, are nourishing the lives of all kinds of kids that are living in group homes right now or in emergency shelters that are going to be starting school in these next couple of weeks. And if you didn't see it, our, our box of school supplies is overflowing. Yeah, that's right. One of our friends works for that group home company. And so that we are here to nourish each other's lives and that Jesus gives us what we need to do that. So we wanted to say thank you for all that hard work and there's even more coming in, some more uh, school supplies that are, are coming in. So right now, uh, before we go back to have our snack, Lily wanted to, do you wanna go ahead and do that? Now would be the fine time. She immediately wanted to show how you two nourish her life. So go ahead and go give that to your mommy and daddy. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, and then as soon as Lily comes back, we're going to pray, and we're going to go back and have our bread snack, but we wanted to make sure that you all know how much you're nourishing other people's lives, and we did this with each other to see how we're nourishing each other's lives, but everybody in here is really important in that too, so let's pray, okay? Dear Jesus, thank you for these people that are here. Thank you for everybody that contributed to our back-to-school box. We want to pray for those kids that maybe are not living with their parents right now, that maybe don't even know who their parents are, and that we are able to help them to have one less thing to worry about. With anything else that might be going on, they're not gonna be worried about not having pens or pencils or markers or a backpack. And we thank you for the gifts that you've given us, the gifts that we are to each other, and that we nourish each other's lives, and most importantly, that you're nourishing us. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Let there be peace. 431. If you're able, let's stand.
whatever information you consume. For us, as Apostle Paul says, is about truthful living. Not assumptions, no pretense. Not lies, but living truthfully. So it doesn't matter where you, where you're at politically, doesn't matter where you're, you're at theologically. Basically, Apostle Paul says, truth telling is what each of us must be. So, go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to tell the truth. Amen?